Lily, open your eyes. I don't want to open my eyes. Nothing good ever happens when I open my eyes. I open my eyes and the world is there and it stinks and bad things happen and everyone blames me for them. Usually because I'm partially responsible a lot of the time. I open my eyes and stuffed rabbits spew demons that possess me and hurt people. What are you going to do if I just lie here with my eyes closed, huh? Lily, I know you can hear me. Yeah, but I don't know you. Your voice is unfamiliar. I don't like that when unfamiliar voices try to wake me up. Are you Tony, the little girl stabber? Maybe you're another demon like Beelzebub or Asmodeus. Yes, I know some of their names. I read a book three months ago at the Winslow Library called something like Demonology ABCs. I can't remember the title exactly. I just remember the pages were yellow and brittle like stale cookies and the drawings looked smudgy as if they'd been done by hand directly into the book. Lily, it's me, Raziel. I open one of my eyes. Everything's still black, but I see a brightly lit exit sign with an arrow pointing nowhere. I realize I'm in the Roxy movie theater again. I'm sitting up, not lying down in my bed like it felt like. It makes me dizzy. The room feels horizontal, but it looks vertical. Last time I was here when David Clark's mother hit me in the back of the head. Nobody hit me in the back of the head this time, I'm just here. I look down at my hands and they're Marty McFlying again. You know, all see-through and stuff. I open my other eye. I'm not really here, am I? I ask, waving my transparent hands between me and the exit sign so I can watch the letters warp. I look at the person sitting next to me through my hand. They look like that painting called The Scream, where their face is all long and distorted. It freaks me out, so I put my hand down. Raziel looks at me quietly. Now that my see-through hand isn't warping his face, it looks very thin and soft-looking like my mom's was, with skin that's a pretzel color like Jamal and his dad. His hair is long and gray. No, silver. It hangs over his shoulders and down his front. His eyes are like kaleidoscopes. They seem to reflect a dozen different colors like the scales of a fish. All he's wearing is a toga like they wear in the Ten Commandments in Ben-Hur. The toga seems to slowly change color like looking at a puddle of oil. No, you're here in the veil. He says softly. But you're also not here. Everyone visits here when they sleep. We do? Nobody mentioned that before. I think I would have remembered the weird people in the maze of doors and Hecate before I came to the veil every time I fell asleep. Raziel nods. Everyone visits, leaving behind their fleeting thoughts, good and bad. For that's what the veil is. Pure, infinite creation. The dreams of normal people fade quickly. But not yours. Yours linger. Just like hers did, the Witch Queen's. I hear shuffling nearby. It's coming from up in the projection booth. Raziel hears it as well and holds a hand up to whoever is up there as if to say, give me a moment. What makes my dream special? I ask him. He rubs his chin and looks down at me. He's really tall. Even sitting down here is like a bean pool. Or maybe I'm just slouching. I do that. Mom and Dad always used to say to sit up, don't slouch. It's bad for your back. I sit up. No, he's just really freaking tall. His eyes glitter like rock candy made out of prisms. I hate rock candy. It hurts to bite. Might as well try to eat an inside-out geode. It's nothing but hard sugar water anyway. Hold up your arm. I hold up my right arm to him. He wiggles the fingers of his other hand slowly, kind of creepy-like shakes his head and strokes at his beardless chin some more. I wonder if he's used to having a beard or something. Do people stroke their chins who don't have beards? No, the other arm. I lower my right arm and hold up my left. Raziel nods and reaches down with both hands. My sleeve slides up my arm like it has a mind of its own. There's nothing there worth noting underneath. Just my plain, pale, hairless arm. Maybe a mole or two. Sometimes when I'm bored in school, I play connect the dots with them and wish I had a couple more to actually make anything more than a line. There it is, he whispers. You don't see it anymore, but it's still there, below your flesh. He takes the nail of one finger and traces it in a circle over my wrist, 
Then he drags it toward the middle like a wave and crisscrosses a star in the center. The witch queen marked you. He looks at me with his lips pursed together and then blows on my arm. I can actually feel his breath. It's cold as the wind in the winter. It gives me goosebumps. When he stops, the goosebumps fade away. And there's still a patch of raised skin on my arm, lighter than the rest, in the same pattern as the one he drew. A circle with a squiggly line inside it and a pointy star in the center. This, Raziel says, drawing his hands away from my arm and sitting up straight. This is ancient magic. I must talk to Samuel. He'll know what to do. I jump out of my seat. I do not want to talk to Samuel. That guy is terrifying, and he wants to kill me. I try to run away, but my legs don't move. Oh, come on, legs, let's get on the same page here. I'm on page 25, and my legs are back on page 6. They do not catch up. Don't worry, Lily. Raziel gestures more with his hands, this time in a way similar to what my dad always did when Roger and I were being loud and he wanted us to lower our voices. You do not need to be with me, and Samuel is not evil, he... Raziel pauses. Okay, he was pretty evil for a long time, but that is not in his nature. Since he has been rehabilitated, he is far less intimidating to talk to, believe me. I imagine in a few centuries, people will feel much the same way about Duma now that he has taken over as the Vale's guardian. Duma? Oh man, I'm already there. I mutter and cross my arms. Did you come see me in my dreams just to blow on my arm and give me a lecture about how the Vale corrupts angels? You brought it up. He shrugs. Well, now I'm bringing it down. Fair enough. He leans around and gestures to the projection booth. Are we going to watch a movie? I ask. Something like that. Have a seat. My legs let me sit. I can stand and I can sit, but they do not want to walk. Is it E.T.? It's a secret. I hear the sound of the film projector starting up and the movie screen is bathed in light. Not a lot of light. Actually, it looks kind of the same amount of light as before. Wait a second. I'm watching a film of the movie theater I'm sitting in. The view is from the small stage at the front of the auditorium where the screen is. I'm looking back up the aisles toward the projection booth. There's Roger sitting in one of those seats eating popcorn. Is this happening now? I look around. No, Roger's not in the theater. Maybe it's another theater? There's an explosion sound and the theater on the screen lights up. Roger whoops and some of his popcorn goes up in the air. He tilts his chin up and tries to catch some of it in his mouth, but it bounces off his nose and lands in his eyes instead. He brushes it out and then spends a minute cursing and rubbing his eye because there's salt in it. This isn't what I thought we'd be watching, I admit to Raziel. I know, he says. Of course he knows. But there's something important we need you to know. Apparently, the important thing is my dead brother's collection of swear words. I already know most of them, though. Here we go. Raziel whispers, pointing at the screen. Two silhouettes appear in the swinging doorway to the theater behind Roger. They walk together down the rows and out of camera, and then appear moments later by his side. They're tall and their heads are out of view, but I recognize the swirly, rainbowy toga and dark skin of the second one. It's Raziel. He's with someone I assume is another angel based on their height and the fact that they're wearing one of those weird radiation suits that Pasher and Duma and the other two angels wore when they came to help save me from Hecate last year. His suit is shiny, metal, yellowy... gold? I think maybe gold. But it's hard to tell because the lighting in the theater is so poor. Roger looks up at the two angels with his good eye while still rubbing popcorn salt out of the other. Who the hell are you guys? He asks. The angel in the golden suit sits down with a loud creak from his rubber pants. I am Zachariel. The person in the suit says through some sort of walkie-talkie sounding device inside the suit's helmet. You may call me Zach. This is my brother Raziel. Raziel on screen sits down beside them both. I glance at Raziel in real life. He's watching the movie of Roger really intently. His eyes are like sparkling and swirling baby disco balls. Let me guess, you're both angels? Roger says, wiggling his fingers in the air to make air quotes. 
If you're going to send me back to my body, you can forget it. I'm not going to just crawl back into the skin suit and lay there dead until you jerks decide to cast me into hell or whatever it is that happens to guys like me. We are not here to send you back, Raziel says in his ever-quiet voice. Raziel next to me echoes the words. We are here to guide you forward. Roger snorts. <laughs> whatever that means. We've met before, you and I. Zachariel says, reaching toward Roger and then pulling his hand away as if it burns. Many years ago. Roger keeps watching the explosions and grunting going on in his movie. Nice try, Clarence, but I haven't been here that long. I'd remember meeting a dweeb in a flashy rubber diving suit. Zachariel and Raziel look at each other and both sigh. Raziel leans around his brother, Angel, so Roger can see his face. Roger looks slightly repulsed by Raziel's weird kaleidoscope eyes. He, slight, he silently mouths one of his swear words. You don't remember, Raziel says while the Raziel beside me repeats himself. Because we took away those memories. Roger scrunches up his face in confusion that slowly twists into anger. Who told you you could do that? You did. Zachariel points at him. I don't understand, I say to Raziel sitting beside me. On the movie screen, Roger looks back and forth between the two angels. I don't understand, he says. Zachariel raises his hand, a single finger pointing skyward. The movie Roger is watching suddenly goes dark just for a moment. Then the screen lights up, but no movie is playing. Who are you? Zachariel asks, lowering his hand and pointing it at Roger's chest. I'm Roger Tiberius Madwhip, assface. Me and my buds are going to be the next Dokken until my sister killed me thanks to you bozos and your weird totem bullshit. He grabs a handful of popcorn and throws it in Zachariel's face. I think he was expecting the angel to flinch so he could punch him in the arm twice for flinching, but Zachariel just sits there looking at him. This seems to annoy Roger more. He turns to watch his movie again, even though the screen is blank. Buzz off. You are Roger Madwhip, Zachariel says. He unfastens the right glove from his suit and pulls his hand out with a hissing of air. Roger isn't paying attention, trying to ignore them both so he doesn't notice Zachariel reaching over until the angel touches him on the side of his head. He jerks away from the hand, and I suddenly feel giddy, thinking Zach the angel is going to give Roger two for flinching himself. But he doesn't. There's a spark that snaps out from the tip of his finger like static electricity. It strikes Roger in the side of the head and he twitches violently. And once you could see things before they happened. I jump out of my chair. My legs stick to the floor like glue and I almost tip forward over the seat in front of me. I only stop from falling head over biscuits because my legs just straight up refuse to leave the ground. I beg your pardon! I yell at the screen. Raziel shushes me. Shh. Sit and learn. He motions to my seat. I sit back down and stare at him. I think my eyes are bugging out of my skull. They feel ready to explode. I beg their pardon? I say at him. He puts a finger to his lips to shush me again. I told you. It's a secret. The camera pans around Roger as his face slowly changes from a scowl to an expression I don't remember ever seeing on him before. Surprise. I'm not saying Roger wasn't ever surprised. I'm sure he had the same expression when he looked out the window of our parents' car as a truck barreled down on him with death behind the wheel. He probably has been surprised by a lot of things in his life. I just don't think I ever saw him surprised. He mostly just looked angry all the time. In the movie of Roger and the Two Angels, Zachary all motions with his hand again and someone starts up the projector as the camera comes to a stop looking over their shoulders at the movie screen. Wait, I frown. Are we really going to watch a movie of Roger watching a movie in my dream? What's next? Is the movie about my parents watching a movie? Will that movie be about me dreaming? I would happily share this secret with you some other way, Raziel says with a sigh. But I don't have any way to. You're a dreamer. Not really here. I can't touch you. You've got to go with what we have, okay?
The movie inside the movie inside my dream comes to life in black and white. It must be really old. I think old movies are black and white because people's hands got too tired from coloring in all the frames by hand. Eventually, they made robots to color in the films and it got easier because robots don't need to sleep and their wrists never get sore. My wrists get sore just coloring in one page from a coloring book. I prefer magic pen activity books anyway. I watch the movie. As I watch it, my vision seems to zoom in like I'm wearing a pair of binoculars. And next thing I know, I'm in the film within the film. Or at least it looks like I am. I look down and can't see my body or hands. I try to move my arms and it feels like I'm moving them, but I can't see them. What's going on? I say frantically. Stop waving your arms, Raziel's voice says from nearby. You'll be fine, just relax and learn. I'm floating over a green, grassy park. There's swings and a jungle gym. Everything's some shade of gray. There's a little dark-haired kid sitting on one of the swings. They're watching other kids play over on the jungle gym. I recognize the park because it's the one over by the reservoir where I always liked to go with my parents when I was little. There are lots of hiking trails there. There's even a castle up on a hill that someone had brought over from Europe, stone by stone. I think it's haunted. The world spins, making me dizzy. It's like I'm the camera and I'm zooming in and around the kid on the swing to reveal the face of Roger when he was nine, maybe ten. I don't have memories of him at that age, but there are plenty of photographs of him around our house from all the way as far back as when he was a baby. He was a cute baby, and I'm not just saying that either. There are some ugly babies in the world, but my brother was a cute baby. Roger sits on the swing, kicking his feet. It feels surreal to see him in front of me like three dimensions, but he's gray tone. I try to look down or up or away, but I can't move my head. I'm frozen in this weird movie with no body. At least I can see. How do I control what I'm looking at? I say out loud. I almost expect Roger to look up at me, but he doesn't. He keeps looking down at his feet. Raziel's voice echoes in my ears. Just relax and watch. I don't like this! I yell. Stupid angel says nothing in response. We look down, finally. There's a doll sitting in Roger's lap. It's wearing camouflage army fatigues in glorious gray and darker gray. I know it anywhere, even without its black felt vest and pants my nana made for it. It's Pasher. It's my Pasher, sitting in my brother Roger's lap wearing combat gear. But why? Hey, Roger batshit! Someone yells. A boy about the same age as Roger walks over with one of those strides that says, I think I'm tough because I can lift an entire gallon of milk. Roger looks up at the boy as he approaches. Hey, Blake, he says almost timidly. Why is he not standing up for our great name? There's no way the Roger I know would let someone call him Roger Batshit and get away with it. This Blake kid should be eating a handful of dirt complete with worms. Two more boys appear behind Blake. Maybe they were always right behind him, but this limited camera view I'm stuck in makes it look like they just sort of appear out of thin air on either side of him. Each boy has one of those mean grins on his face. You know, the kind bullies wear when they're thinking of doing something mean. One of the new boys, one with a big mop of black hair and eyes like a shark moves past Blake and snatches Pasher out of Roger's lap. Roger's instantly on his feet. Hey, give me back my Joe, he yells. The bully turns Pasher over. I just wanted to see if it'll give me magic powers, too. If you're wanting to know if you'll wet the bed again tonight, the answer is yes, Roger says. That sounds more like the Roger I remember. The bully's face turns... grayer. His face melts into an angry, teeth-grind scowl. He chucks Pasher like a football across the playground. Pasher! I yell. Joe! Roger shouts. Get bent, loser! says the bully, who winds up and punches Roger in the face. Roger goes down on his butt in the sand with blood pouring out of his nose. The three boys walk away, two laughing. I can hear Blake saying to his bully friend, You wet the bed, dude? That's so gross. Bedwetting is nothing to be ashamed of, Raziel whispers from across the void. 
Why are you telling me that? I'm just saying. We follow Roger as he shuffles across the playground like a death row inmate on his way to the electric chair. He picks up Pasher and brushes some dirt off his features. Are you okay? Roger asks. Of course. I hear Pasher's familiar voice. I hate that it makes my heart jump. I miss him as bad as I would my arm if it got cut off. Well, the right arm, anyway. The left arm seems... superfluous sometimes. That's a word my mom taught me. It means unnecessary. Both words are a real pain in the butt to spell, but superfluous sounds more grand. Something's not just fluous. It's superfluous. Roger, are you okay? My heart all but bursts out of my chest now. It's my mom. Carrying little toddler me. She looks younger and happier and alive. <laughs> I feel myself start to cry, but, but it doesn't affect my vision. I try to wipe my eyes anyway, despite being without form, and I feel a sharp pain as I jab myself in the eye with a finger. That just makes my eyes well up even more. Even with all these tears, I can see everything clearly. It's kind of awful. Are you all right? Raziel asks. I feel pressure on my shoulder despite not having a shoulder. Not really, I admit to him. I haven't been alright for a long time. My mom sets little me down and I toddle as toddlers do, right over to Roger and tug on his pant leg. Wow, well, are you all right? Toddler me says. Oh jeez, I sound so adorable. <laughs> I laugh at myself through my tears. It's just a bunch of kids from school. Roger mopes, grinding his toe into the grass. He ruffles toddler me's hair with his free hand. I'll never see them again after high school. Blake is going to join the military and get shot in some sandy desert place. Todd is going to work at the shoe store and have a heart attack when he's only 46. He'll be living alone and one of his dogs is going to get desperately hungry and eat some of him before neighbors complain about the smell. Toddler me giggles. Doggy! As for Lucas, well, stop! My mother says in her harsh tone that I used to be all too familiar with. Please, just stop. Roger looks up at her for a moment with shame in his eyes and then hugs past her tight. I'm sorry. Sometimes these things... I know, dear. Mom picks baby Lily up and then hugs Roger to her hip. But you need to keep these kinds of thoughts to yourself, okay? Roger hugs her and Lily back with both arms. Okay. I'm suddenly thrust back into my body and slam into the theater seat so hard my legs fly up. Even Raziel looks surprised by it. Goodness, he says, his pinwheel eyes never blinking. My apologies for that bit of bumpiness. My companion in the projector booth just informed me that there is a critical matter at hand in the waking world. Critical what now? I ask, grabbing my head. I shouldn't have felt that from being thrown back into my chair, should I have? This is a dream, after all. That's part of the problem. Raziel shifts uncomfortably in his seat and looks back over his shoulder. Baratio, run the live feed. The screen lights up again. We're looking at... What are we looking at? It's blurry, but familiar. I don't know what I'm supposed to be seeing. This is from your own eyes, Lily. Well, my eyes are clearly stupid, I say, gesturing at the screen with annoyance. Maybe I need glasses. I didn't used to need glasses. A weird sound plays over the sound system. It's like, ba-bump, ba-bump, ba-bump. A heartbeat? No, it's more like the sound my parents' car used to make when we drove down the highway. Oh, I get excited when I realize what we're looking at. That's the ceiling of a car! <laughs> see? Every now and then when my head rocks, you can see the back window. I pause, my mouth hanging open for a moment. Wait. Why am I in a car? I should be in a bed. Lights flash in and out of my view, probably passing streetlights or something. Someone in the front of the car coughs loudly, clearing their throat. They mumble to themselves, and then we hear the click of the radio being turned on and the sound of changing stations. They stop on one playing a song in a language I don't know. 
The driver snorts and says something like, Menundo. I don't know what that means. I think she's being abducted, yells the guy up in the projector booth. Yes, thank you, Baratiel. Raziel waves his hand dismissively, then grabs the sides of his head and shuts his eyes tight. Give me a moment, Lily. We were not expecting this. I don't know how this individual was able to abscond with you. You were being carefully monitored ever since the other night when you tore Meredith Patterson's soul out of Elysium. I blink. I have no idea what you're saying. What I'm saying is, you've made a right mess of things for us lately, and Pasher has been flying all over the place trying to fix everything before it goes too far. I wonder if that's why I've been having trouble getting in touch with him. Or maybe why it hurts my head to try and see the future. But he did sing to me when I was hiding in that empty warehouse, so I guess he's still taking time to keep an eye on me. Thank you, Pasher, I say to myself. Thanks, Pasher. Sleeping me on the movie screen slurs. Oops. The radio shuts off with a click. The bumps get farther and farther apart. The lights flash by less frequently. And then there's a squeak of a brake and the sound of someone pulling the emergency brake. Hey, are you awake? Asks a familiar voice. I recognize it from the warehouse. It's Tony the Child Stabber, the warehouse burner downer. Oh, crap! I try and stand up, but my legs feel like lead. I'm with Tony! Raziel frowns. Tony? On the screen, groggy me mumbles. Oh, crap, I'm just Tony. A big round face fills the screen. It's a little blurry, but it moves closer and my half-slit eyes focus on it. Raziel and I lean forward in our seats at the same time. Tony's face is hidden in shadow, but for a second he shifts back up and sticks something in his mouth. We watch as his face briefly illuminates by the flame of a lighter as he lights a cigarette. He takes a long drag on it, his face glowing orange, and then blows a cloud of smoke right into my face, turning the screen murky. I choke and cough from the sudden feeling of smoke in my lungs. Go back to sleep, Tony says, settling back into the driver's seat. Little horse of Satan. Raziel puts a hand on the back of my chair and turns to the projection booth. Better yell, rewind. The images on the screen start playing in reverse like on a VCR, but smoother and without those weird scrub lines that muck up the tape. I once watched the entirety of E.T. the Extraterrestrial on Rewind, which makes it the story of an alien coming to Earth very sick until government scientists rescue him and then hand him over to a boy and his friends to play Dungeons and Dragons with. Stop there. Raziel snaps. I take a deep breath of clean air tinged with cigarette smoke and then look up. The screen is now filled with Tony's face, illuminated by the frozen glow of his lighter. His face is thin and pocketed with little scars. Maybe he cuts himself shaving a lot? I always thought vampires must have the hardest time shaving since they have no reflection. Maybe Tony is a vampire. Oh no, Raziel whispers. His voice sounds upset. I think I understand now. Well, I don't. I memorize Tony's face. He doesn't look like a bad guy. He looks more like a tired guy. Pastor always used to say that nobody's completely bad, that everybody has goodness in them, and some people do bad things because of sadness in their hearts, which can make them seem bad to other people. I'm usually quick to remind Pastor that Lisa Welch exists. You need to wake up, Lily, Raziel says with urgency. Now. We'll finish Roger's story another time. Speaking of Roger, the last time I was here in the Vale was with Roger, and he woke me up by slapping me ridiculously hard. I'd really rather not go through that again, so I try slapping myself instead. I don't feel it. I pinch at my cheeks, but I can't feel that either. I slap harder. Nothing. Stupid sleeping hands! Baratio! Raziel shouts to the guy in the booth. Take this information to Pashir immediately! Right, yells Baratiel. Raziel turns to me. His eyes are glowing now like fireworks. His hands, too. I will bind to you, Lily, he says. And maybe together we can get you out of this. Uh, okay. He sticks his glowing hands straight into my head like the ghost that I am. It burns inside my brain. Everything goes white in my eyes. 
The theater is gone. Raziel is gone. I'm lying on my back in a filthy looking car that smells like tobacco and junior mints. Tony is humming to himself in the front seat, some song I don't recognize. I sit up quietly, slowly, trying to keep my head down but get a look out the window to see where we are. I happen to do so just as Tony turns the car into what looks like an old, unused gas station. He drives past the gas pumps and takes the car around back of the store part of the station. There's a skeleton of a building back there with a sign for a car wash. I used to love going through a car wash. I don't know if I'll enjoy them anymore after this. The car slows and comes to a stop in the dark cave of the car wash. Be careful, Lily. I hear Raziel's voice in my head. He's got an athame. I don't know what that is, I whisper. Huh? The child stabber says from the front seat. He twists his head around and looks directly at me. His mouth curls up in a smile. It's not good when child stabbers smile at you. Especially when you're a child. Oh, crap. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I want to tell you thanks so much for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast if you happen to be listening to this as a podcast or as a YouTube or however else you managed to have found this story for tonight. And as always, I would love to give a big thank you to everyone who's supporting me over on Patreon. You guys are the real MVPs. You guys keep things going, especially while things have been nuts for me over the past couple of months and things have been getting crazier and crazier as time goes on. You guys are the ones who are keeping me sane. And I mean that with all sincerity that you guys have helped me immensely. So in my personal life and my professional life, I want to give a very big thank you to... Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Jacob Fensky, Chance Burnett, Diana Krauss, Lakeda Canizales, Mr. B. Foster Pepper Squeezer, Travis, Joseph Calarudo, Rudy B, Dante Kincaid, Boxhound 803, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Priorch, Bastion Beefcake, Jeff Pitoy's Cultist, Love You M&M, M, Insanity Gamer X, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Emma Cork, Jay Kearns, Himbo Jerry, Sam High, Crusader Chocobo, Adam Marius, Captain Scurvy, Estabeen, Raiden Morris, Nate Cull, Our Min Sack Time, Angelus, Seclude, That Creepy Chick, Red Shadow Cat, Xavier and Cheyenne, Six Gay Rats in a Trench Coat, Turtle Man, Cryolinian, Lord Life's Best, Goring Tri Magazine, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Michael Limchok, Jerk Diver 030, Matt Bach, Voice of Sam, Shelly J, Bacamel, The Leader Count, Melted Lake, Holly Sue, William King, Sashi Sasaku, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Happy Birthday, Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, 80 Nephew, Theater Chip, Acid System, Mog, Kiri the Sloth, Buster's Lampshade, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, and Corey Kenshin. To everyone on this list, everyone in the description, and of course anyone who could support even just one dollar, thank you all so much for making my life significantly easier with this. And if you guys would like to be able to join any of the names that you see here, or down there, or anything at all, head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. And with that, I wish you all a very, very pleasant night, and sweet dreams.